In the 1960s, spies were all the rage. The real-life spying between the United States and Russia sparked a fascination for all things espionage. There were spies in movies, TV, some were serious and some were funny. The most popular was James Bond, and producer Dan Melnick had the idea to do a James Bond spoof on TV. He hired the comedy writers Mel Brooks and Buck Henry, yes that Mel Brooks and yes that Buck Henry, to create it. The series focused on the good organization Control and the evil organization Chaos. At Control, there was Ed Platt as the stern and serious chief, Barbara Feldon as the sexy and smart Agent 99, and Don Adams as the bumbling Agent 86 Maxwell Smart. There was also the dimwitted Larrabee, Agent K-13, and Agent 44, and later Agent 13, who were always hiding in the oddest places. The series had crazy spy gadgets like the shoe phone, and memorable catchphrases like, Sorry about that, Chief, and missed it by that much. There was clever satire and silly slapstick. The series got 14 Emmy nominations and won seven, including three for Don Adams as Maxwell Smart. They did 138 episodes in five seasons, and here are their top 10 best ones. This man is Secret Agent 86. Would you believe plastic surgery? His mission is to find out the top 10 episodes of Get Smart and report it back to the Chief of Control. Hello, Chief! I have just figured out every detail about the number 10 episode of Get Smart. Excellent work, Max. What's the title? Would you believe almost every detail? In the two-parter, The Not-So-Great Escape, Siegfried and Stocker are running a Nazi-inspired prisoner of war camp for kidnapped control agents. Prisoners of Camp Gichigumi Nunewa! You have been beaten, tortured, starved, maimed, and whipped. And now the picnic is over! One of the subgenres of Get Smart are the parody episodes. They did the Maltese Falcon, the Prisoner of Zenda, etc, etc, etc. They're always fun, and they usually give Don Adams a chance to show off his excellent impression skills. And I think this is the best parody episode. They're homaging both The Great Escape and Stalag 17. The Great Escape providing the adventure quality, and Stalag 17 providing the suspense of having a double agent spying for the Nazis. So in a sense, they actually improve upon the source material by combining both ideas. The other reason I think this parody episode has an edge over the others is some of the other ones seem a little forced to me. Like in Maxwell Smart Private Eye. Why is Max talking to Comfrey Bogart? If you haven't seen the Maltese Falcon, baby, you just think it was weird. But because Siegfried is a previously established Nazi-themed villain, the parody fits the characters. So you can enjoy this as a Get Smart episode, regardless if you've seen The Great Escape or not. This note contains the number 9 episode of Get Smart. It's an invisible ink. In 99 Loses Control, Agent 99 leaves Control and is going to marry the casino owner Victor Royale. Max is jealous and tries to stop her. And they find out that Victor is actually a chaos agent. The relationship between Max and 99 is one of the main strengths and subplots of the show. 99 is 100% in love with 86. I wonder if my old math teacher likes this show. Now Max loves her too, but he treats her like a guy, his partner. This dynamic brings so much to every episode. Unfortunately, the episodes that make it its main focus tend to be weaker ones. For example, when Max and 99 get married, it feels too much like a normal sitcom, and you can kind of tell it was done just to raise the ratings. But this episode was done just to explore the characters a little more. The joke of 99 always being ignored by Max has had some effect, and she's given up hope on him and had to find another man. And it shows that Max cares because when he finds out that she's leaving control, he is genuinely hurt. He's never pursued her romantically, so he can't say anything directly. But you could tell that on the inside he's saying, How could you leave me? So it's Susan Hilton. I worked with you for five years and you never told me your name. You never asked. Oh. Well, I don't like it. I like 99 a lot better. 
Incidentally, Susan Hilton is not 99's real name. It's just a cover. Her real name is never revealed on the series. Some trivia books get this wrong, but my video is right, because I'm the Agent 86 of YouTube. Yeah! Get Smart isn't a show that's known for tugging at your heartstrings, but seeing a heartbroken Max makes this quite the touching episode. Hello, Chief! The number 8 episode is Part 1 and Part 2 of The Little Black Book. Hmm? Sorry about that. Wrong number. Max's old army buddy Sid Krim, played by Don Rickles, becomes mixed up in Max's spying. Incidentally, both men really did serve in World War II. What makes this episode great is the chemistry between Don Adams as a Maxwell Smart and Don Rickles as Sid Krim. They were friends in real life, and just like in this show, Don Rickles would sometimes call Don Adams dummy. And they were both two of the best stand-up comedians of the era. In Don Adams' act, he would do this impression of William Powell from the Thin Man movie, with this real nasally and strident voice. And that developed into the character Detective Glick that he did on the Bill Dana show. And that eventually developed into the character Maxwell Smart. Now with Don Rickles, he was known as an insult comic, and his nickname was Mr. Warmth. So this episode is the two of them doing their thing. Don Adams is Maxwell Smart, and then Don Rickles is insulting him and reacting to all the spy craziness. Look, Max, do me a favor. When we're out with the girls tonight, don't talk into the shoe. I understand, but they're liable to think you're a little eccentric. Rickles even does his own Don Adams impression, which is perfect. When these guys are together, sparks fly. So many, in fact, that this was originally planned as a one-part episode, but they had lived so much, it became a two-parter. And just like the Blues Brothers or Tommy Boy, this is an excellently done buddy comedy. Now to find my contact for the information. Agent 13? I-86. Agent 13, what's the number 7 episode? Oh, well, you'll have to wait an hour. I'm on lunch. And the Groovy Guru, the criminal DJ the Groovy Guru, is using subliminal messages in his music to put teenagers in a trance. As if Get Smart can get any more 60s, this is the episode where they spoof the hippie counterculture. The episode is filled with psychedelic colors, humorous signs encouraging juvenile delinquency, there are references to 60s bands like Simon and Garfunkel, and Max even goes undercover as a hippie. Don Adams' childhood friend, Larry Storch, who's about 40, plays the groovy guru to the hilt. And he has a groovy yet diabolical rock and roll band working with them, the Sacred Cows. And they try to hypnotize Max in 99. These swinging sounds won't just be hip, they'll be hypnotizing! So Scooby Dooby Doo, Chaos will walk in and take over. Go, babies! Thrill, thrill, thrill! Kill, kill, kill! Make a scene. Knock off a Dean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bump off a square. That's what it's about. Hate is in. Love is out. Kill, kill, kill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Max has a dismissive view towards hippie culture, and they have quite a few hilarious jokes at their expense. However, they keep it fair, and while Max is knocking the hippies, this episode makes him out to be a dirty old man. They've done sex jokes with Max here and there, but in this episode, they really go for it. He tries to get the sexy female scientist over to his house, and during the meditation scene, he thinks meditation is silly, but he keeps staring at the girl's navel. One of the attributes about hippie culture was free love. Well, Max believes in free love too, but in a more old fashioned, pinch your waitress's butt kind of way. Which generation is more ridiculous? The answer is both. And leave it to Get Smart to show it. Agent 86, I've been shot! Agent 63, what's it called? A bullet wound! I meant the episode title. I don't have time... to tell you. And the diplomat's daughter, Max is assigned to protect the princess. Meanwhile, the claw is out to get her and Max. This episode introduces one of my favorite villains, the Claw. The Claw is the head of the Oriental Arm of Chaos. It is a spoof of Chinese movie villains, like Fu Manchu. And just like the notorious Fu Manchu, he's played by a white actor, Leonard Strong, who actually specialized in playing Asian roles. 
He's charismatic, fiendish, and has a claw for a hand. However, because he's a spoof, he doesn't like torture and has his assistant Bobo do it. Also, his accent makes him difficult to understand whenever he says his name, creating one of the most famous jokes of the series. I suppose you could guess what they call me, Lefty? No, Mr. Smart. I am employed by Chaos. My name is The Craw. The Craw? No, not The Craw. The Craw! Craw! Now, in today's politically correct world, I could see where this might be offensive to both the Chinese community and to those with prosthetic limbs. Two for one, baby. But I still laugh at it. Because if someone has an accent that's different from your own and you're not used to it, it can be hard to understand. And this is partially a joke on Max. Because the man has a claw for a hand. Only an idiot would think he was saying craw. After it gets smart, Don Adams would battle another craw. I mean craw. When Don played Inspector Gadget. The other actor who really gets to shine in this episode is Ed Platt as a chief. Ed was more known as a dramatic actor. Like in movies like Rebel Without a Cause. And he gives a serious and distinguished performance that gives weight to the series and makes Control a believable organization. However, he also has perfect comic timing, like when he gets frustrated and yells at Max. Sometimes he's like a father figure. In this episode, he has a very sweet scene with 99 when he realizes that she loves Max. And he can be silly himself, like when 99 teaches him how to dance. No matter how far out he goes, he always retains the dignity befitting the Chief of Control which only makes it funnier. Now to report back to number five, episode two control. Stop right there, Schmott. You may stop me, Siegfried, but at this very moment, there are 1,000 control agents racing to headquarters with the information. I find that very hard to believe. Would you believe 23? I don't think so. How about a couple of carrier pigeons? In aboard the Orient Express, Max 99 are on a suicide mission on the train, the Orient Express. What I love about this episode is the atmosphere of the Orient Express. Trains have an inherent dramatic quality. It's not just me, Alfred Hitchcock thought they were dramatic too. Because they're going so fast and there's no way to get off. They're dangerous because they could crash. And this train does go through a thing called Dead Man's Curve. The rooms and the halls are small so they're claustrophobic. And you're surrounded by strangers and you don't know who to trust. While the mood is heavy, there are tons of great gags. Agent 44 is hiding in the medicine chest. And it's here's Johnny, the old host of The Tonight Show, Johnny Carson, has a cameo as the conductor, which gives you a great sense of the era. Don Adams, who is a master at both verbal and physical comedy, gets a lot to do too. He has great lines. His shoes have compressed air in them, so at one point he flies up in the air. There's also a running gag where he keeps getting secret messages, but so that no one else will read them, he destroys them by eating them. It's a new fat diet. All the vitamins and none of the carbohydrates. Overall, this episode is a great ride. Siegfried may have taken my shoe, but he forgot one thing. The old Chief Sandwich Phone trick. Hello, Chief. The number four episode is Somebody Down Here Hates Me. This cheese is out of order. I knew I should have got corned beef. Siegfried puts a huge reward out for Max's death, leaving him paranoid that everyone is going to kill him. This is a wonderful plot, because it allows for both suspense... And comedy! One of the things I always liked about Get Smart is that even though it's silly, as a spy adventure, you could take it seriously. There was real violence. People get shot at and die all the time. And in this one, Max is in danger of losing his life every second. So it's especially exciting. But he's so nervous about it that he suspects everyone. And that's where the comedy comes from. He suspects the chief. He suspects Agent 13 who's hiding in the freezer. And he suspects and attacks random people walking down the street who he thinks are chaos agents in disguise. Hold it, 99, that man over there. That's a man? Yes, it's a brilliant disguise. 
but it's actually Chaos Agent Melvin Forrester. Notice the twitching of the neck muscles. It's a dead giveaway. I've got to get him before he gets us. But Max, you're already up for one count of assault and battery. Ah! Would you believe two counts? It's hysterical. And then Max goes to Dr. Noodleman, the plastic surgeon. And then there's the big twist. The reason Max thought these guys were chaos agents was because of their facial twitches. And we find out that Dr. Noodleman is actually working for chaos and he did surgery on those people. So those really were chaos agents trying to kill him. So as nuts as everyone thought he was, Max was a right. That's one of the things I find endearing about his character. He really believes all the crazy stuff he does will help bring chaos to an end. And at the end of the episode, it always does. I guess that's a spoiler. Sorry about that, Chief. Now for the number three episode. Number three, this information is top secret. This calls for the cone of silence. In Back to the Old Drawing Board, Chaos has created an all-powerful robot named Jaime to go undercover as a control agent. This is their introduction of Jaime the Robot, played by Richard Gaudier. Eventually, this character will become Max's best friend, but in his first outing, he's more of a villain. As a Chaos Robot, he has super strength, he has super intelligence, and when programmed to, can destroy anything. When he beats up Agent 91, he has a slight smile on his face and is truly a frightening figure. However, they also have this hysterical running gag that because he's a robot, he takes everything literally. Agent 84 is in the clock in the next room. Ask him if he knows anything. Well, hop to it, Jaime. In one of the funniest ones, Max tells Jaime, just do what I do. So they do like a mirror routine where Jaime does exactly what Max does. So just like the last one, this episode has that great balance of real danger and humor. But then it goes a step further. Max, who has a bit of a literal way of thinking too, the rule says we have to use a cone of silence, so that's what we're going to do, takes a liking to Jaime and a protectiveness over him. And Jaime likes Max because he treats him like a person, even after he finds out he's a robot. Then Chaos tells Jaime to kill Max and the others. Max is understanding about it, but then Jaime starts to cry and decides to kill Chaos instead because he wants to be with his friends. So Jaime grows as a character and becomes a good guy. Max shows a different side to himself. And this episode has a bit of a heartwarming quality while still having a great, exciting, and funny spy story. Now for the number two episode. It's in my specially designed code. Not even Control can figure it out. In the pilot episode, Mr. Big, the Chief gives Max a new partner, Agent 99, and a new mission to stop Mr. Big. Because they weren't sure if the show was gonna sell or not, they didn't want to spend the money on color, which is why this is the only episode ever done in black and white. The color gives Get Smart a wacky quality, whereas here, the black and white gives it more of a dramatic one, and it feels more in touch with the serious spy stories that it's spoofing. Along with setting up the plot and characters, this pilot also sets up the relationship between Max and 99. 99 is clearly attracted to Max, but Max literally does not realize she's a girl until the episode is over halfway over when she takes off her hat and reveals her long hair. After this episode, he's aware of her gender, but until he proposes to her in season four, it doesn't make much of a difference. Along with setting up the show, this episode has one of the funniest, most creative and freshest scripts of the entire series, largely because it was a collaboration between four comedy geniuses all giving their own ideas while being inspired from each other. There was the executive producer Leonard Stern, who used to write for Abbott and Costello and The Honeymooners. There was Buck Henry, who would go on to write The Graduate. Mel Brooks and all the stuff he did. And Don Adams himself brought a lot of stuff from his comedy act to the show, like the Would You Believe routine. So they had an amazing group working on this episode. 
We know that Mel Brooks came up with the shoe phone and that Leonard Stern came up with the opening and closing of the doors during the credits. But with some of the jokes, you can kind of guess who came up with it. Like, I bet you Mel Brooks came up with Mr. Big because it's like the same joke of Darth Helmet in Spaceballs. Unfortunately, Mel Brooks had to leave very early on in this series to work on the movie The Producers, and the only two other scripts that he wrote were with other writers. So this is the only episode where this incredible collaboration took place. Along with the script, this episode also highlights two of the best and most memorable spy gadgets of the series. The shoe phone, which starts ringing in the middle of a concert, and the cone of silence which is a device for discussing top secret information. But unfortunately, it never works right. What do you know about chaos? What? Chaos! Oh, chaos! As an international criminal organization that was founded in 1957. What? 57. 57? Agent 57 is in Hong Kong. What? Hong Kong! Oh, Hong Kong! Max, why are we talking about Hong Kong? Hodgkins raised the cone of silence. What? Raise the cone of silence! These two gadgets are so funny. But they couldn't keep repeating the same joke. So they could only use the cone of silence sporadically. The shoe phone they used a little more because it was a functional phone. But still, it's great to see both of these shown off so well. Incidentally, the way Mel Brooks came up with the shoe phone was his and Buck's office was a total mess. And the phone was ringing and they couldn't find it. So they were picking up newspapers and saying hello. And clothes and saying hello. And then Mel Brooks took off his shoe and said hello. After being shot at by Siegfried, the Goofy Guru, and the Craw, I have finally made it back to Control Headquarters. And the number one Get Smart episode is... Closed early due to budget cuts. Missed it by that much. Siegfried kidnaps a chief, so Max kidnaps Chaos's number one assassin. Chaos keeps kidnapping control agents, and control keeps kidnapping Chaos agents, until Siegfried and Max are the only ones left. This episode has a wonderfully goofy plot, so it's perfect for Get Smart. It's as silly as it sounds, so there's lots of great jokes, but it also allows for some action. Like the scene where Max kidnaps the assassin is especially well done and exciting. But what it's most known for is the introduction of the main villain of Get Smart, who will go on to appear in 14 episodes, Bernie Capel as Siegfried! Siegfried is the vice president in charge of public relations and terror for chaos. He has a thick German accent and comes across a little like a Nazi. He has a villainous scar on his face, he's intense, angry, vicious, and has total contempt for the human race. So whenever he does something goofy, it's even funnier. And he has the perfect catchphrase for his dictator personality. What just happened? Your chief was just silenced by a piece of that? Well, that's a little drastic, Siegfried. Couldn't you shush them? They don't shush here! He's just as into being a criminal mastermind as Max is into being a spy, making Siegfried the perfect nemesis. Final thing that I love about this episode is how it makes fun of the government. Get Smart is a mixture of low and highbrow humor, and one of his favorite jokes is showing the incompetence of the government. Control is a government agency, after all. Both Control and Chaos spend so much time, energy, and money trying to combat each other. You kidnap our guy, we're going to kidnap yours. And at the end, they just exchange everybody, so it literally gets them nowhere. The only person that Chaos is able to successfully kidnap is the bus driver. So as always, when the government battles it out, it's the working class taxpaying citizen who loses. They also make a joke about the president being at his ranch for roundup time instead of working hard in the White House. And replace ranch with golf course and his political commentary works just as well today. And so does the episode. I hope you've enjoyed your look at the top 10 episodes of Get Smart. And at this very moment, this video is being watched by millions of people across the United States. Would you believe Illinois? How about the old folks home?